Welcome to the Stammering Self-Empowerment Programme's online course. This edition of the online course was fully revised this year and hopefully you'll find it helpful and easy to follow. If you have any difficulties understanding it or if you experience any technical problems getting the various slideshows and presentations to work, please do feel free to contact me by email and I'll do what I can to help. And don't worry, I don't charge for this service. It's completely free. Today, I want to start by briefly introducing some key understandings about stammering that it's helpful to be aware of and to bear in mind while you're working your way through the course. As you listen to each of these, try to relate them to your own personal experience. The first key understanding is that the extent to which we stammer is strongly influenced by our attitudes and beliefs about stammering and about speech in general. Take a look at these survey results from the National Stuttering Association in the United, in the United States. They summarise the experiences of over 700 adults and teenagers who underwent a variety of different forms of therapy for stammering. The participants were divided into three broad groups. The first group underwent therapy designed to enable them to speak without stammering. The second group underwent therapy that taught them techniques to enable them to stammer more easily. And the third group underwent therapy that was designed to change their attitudes towards stammering through study and education. The different coloured bars show how successful each of these three therapy approaches was in helping the stammerers who tried them out. These results show very clearly that all three therapy approaches helped some clients a lot and all three approaches failed with other clients. But as you can see from the purple bars, out of these three different approaches, the ones that were highly successful with the greatest proportion of people who stammer were the, were the approaches that involved changing attitudes towards speaking and stammering. We took these findings in, into account when designing the Stammering Self-Empowerment Programme's online course. And as a consequence, the therapy part of our programme is divided into three modules, each corresponding to one of the three broad approaches to therapy listed in this NSA survey. Specifically, there's a fluency shaping module, which teaches some techniques that you can employ in a purely symptomatic way at times when you need to speak without stammering. There's a module that teaches a technique called the jump, which is designed to enable you to quickly and easily get started again when you get stuck. And there's a third module which is designed to help you to develop attitudes towards speaking and stammering that are conducive to fluent speech. In order for you to gain maximum benefit from our online course, it's important that you find the approach that's best suited to the type of stammering that you personally produce. Hence, at the start of the course, we propose a variety of different options, each one corresponding to a particular type of stammering. You can then decide, based on the information we provide, which of these options is most suitable for yourself. Our course also includes the module entitled Understanding Stammering. This module provides more detailed information about the nature of stammering, including why it occurs, how it develops over time, and how much can realistically be done to ameliorate it. Whichever of the three therapy approaches you decide to adopt, we suggest that you also work your way through this fourth module as the information it provides will enable you to develop more helpful attitudes and beliefs about stammering, and it should also help you to understand how the various approaches to stammering therapy work and how to get the most out of them. The second key understanding about stammering is that everyone stammers sometimes. It's just that some people do it more than others, and not everyone is conscious of the fact that they do it. What I mean by this is that everyone occasionally in their life has moments when they try to say something and yet nothing comes out. 
The main difference between stammerers and non-stammerers is that in stammerers, these moments happen much more frequently and they get in the way of successful communication. And they may also cause listeners to perceive that there's something wrong. Because of this, stammerers tend to evaluate their moments of stammering negatively. In contrast, in non-stammerers, such moments happen relatively rarely, and when they do happen, they often fulfil a useful purpose, inasmuch as they may prevent them from saying things that are likely to be socially inappropriate, or from speaking at times when it would be inappropriate to speak. This online course is not intended to completely stop you stammering. On the contrary, the course is designed to transform your stammering from something that impairs your ability to communicate successfully into something that augments your, uh, your ability to communicate successfully. Reflecting this change, as you work through the course, the timing of your moments of stammering should, should start to change so that they only tend to occur at moments when it would be unhelpful or inappropriate to speak. As this change happens, the way you evaluate your stammering moments will change from negative to positive. And you may start to perceive that your stammering is essentially a safety mechanism that regulates in a subconscious automatic way what you're able to say and when you're able to say it. The problem in people who stammer, or rather in people whose stammering is a problem, is simply that this regulating mechanism is not well tuned. The third key understanding is that stammering cannot be controlled by the use of force. Many people who stammer spend years trying unsuccessfully to use their willpower to consciously control their muscle movements when they get stuck. Often, despite their lack of success, they continue to think that if they could just try a little harder or wait a little longer, then somehow they'd be able to make those muscles move in the way that they want them to move. The reality, however, is that when we're stammering, it's often not possible to use our willpower to initiate the muscle movements necessary to say the sound or word that we're stuck on. And it's unhelpful to continue to try to do so. On the contrary, in order to minimise the disruptive effect of our stammering, and in order to stop traumatising ourselves and developing extreme secondary symptoms, it's essential to stop continuing to try to move muscles that don't want to move. Instead, we need to be pragmatic, and in particular, we need to learn to accept our blocks when they arise, and we need to find quick and easy ways of getting around them and getting our messages across without resorting to the use of excessive force. My fourth key observation is that severe stammering is traumatising and it's better to avoid it if at all possible. Mild stammering, and by that I mean stammering that doesn't hold us up for a long time and doesn't involve the production of any extreme secondary symptoms, is fine. If you want to learn to overcome our fear of stammering and reduce the tendency for moments of stammering to occur, it's important that we allow ourselves to stammer mildly. However, if we allow ourselves to stammer severely, we're likely to traumatise ourselves and to lay down traumatic memories that will then resurface each time we find ourselves in similar speaking situations. Such memories substantially increase the frequency with which stammering moments will arise in the future. In order to be able to overcome our fear of stammering and in order to reduce our tendency to get stuck, we need to avoid severe stammering as much as possible. Many therapists encourage their clients to stubbornly resist time pressure and to keep trying to say words they're stuck on, even if it takes several seconds to do so. In this regard, our online course differs substantially from other courses. We believe that if a sound or word doesn't come out more or less straight away, it's better to either skip it altogether or to immediately find a different way of communicating it. The fifth key understanding that will help you to gain control over your stammering is that our value as human beings is not in any way related to how well we can speak. 
In many ways, this is the most important understanding of all. And until we arrive at this understanding and come to truly believe it, even if our stammering does go into remission, disfluencies, speech errors and experiences of verbal communication failure will continue to destabilize us and render us prone to relapse. So in order to remain reliably free from stammering, or rather from the disorder of stammering, and from the fear of relapse, we really need to arrive at this understanding. This is not something that can be acquired through speech therapy. Rather, each of us has to get there through our own efforts and through the gradual accumulation and integration of our life experiences. Ultimately, it boils down to a matter of personal and spiritual development. It's impossible to predict in advance when this understanding will become sufficiently robust to render us no longer afraid of stammering. But the more effort we devote to personal and spiritual development, the sooner it's likely to happen.